Hi, Breasty. Welcome back to my breast explant journey. I'm Carla Marie, and if this is your first episode of this mini series, I highly recommend going back and listening to episode number one. That is where I explain why I am deciding to do this, so go and do that. Also, this podcast posts within the Morning Show podcast feed. That is my day job, so give that a listen as well. It's a daily podcast under 25 minutes, and it gives you everything you need to start your day. I've had a lot of people ask me why I chose to go to Florida to have a breast explant. Dr. Rankin came highly recommended from my friend, Lala, who was on a previous episode of this podcast. Then I had an informational call with his patient care coordinator, D. Hicks, who was also on a previous episode of this podcast. And during that call, Dee was telling me how Dr. Rankin believes in breast implant illness so much so that he no longer does implants. He only does explants. And I was sold. So I book my surgery after getting on the cancellation list for Dr. Rankin. And when I started doing this podcast and mentioning I was having this done, I had So many people reaching out to me saying, hey, I don't know if you have a doctor or not yet, but you should go see Dr. Rankin in Florida. I mean, so many people reaching out. Then I found out that Claire Crowley, who was on The Bachelorette, actually went to Dr. Rankin for her explant, and obviously she had great things to say about him as well. So the reason I decided to go to Florida for my explant was Dr. Rankin. And now it's time for you to meet him. Okay, Dr. Rankin, I'm so glad that I have you here today because you, sir, are the bell of the ball because every time I mention to literally anyone that I'm getting an explant, they say to me, oh my God, there's this doctor in Florida. You should go to him. I see everyone goes to him. And I'm like, who? And they say, Dr. Rankin. I'm like, thank God that's who you're about to tell me. So you're famous. (laughs) Awesome. Well, that's great to hear. At least uh, you're getting some positive feedback. So. I know. It's like, <laughs> so poof, let's go back in time to when you decided to get into plastic surgery in general. Why did you want to become a plastic surgeon? Well, I've wanted to be a surgeon since I was a little kid. I always knew that's what I wanted to do. So I went through medical school, got into general surgery, just not knowing what I wanted to do yet. And I started to kind of work different operating rooms, orthopedics, general surgery, everything. And plastics is what really um, I felt most comfortable with. So did my general surgery, matched into plastic surgery, and now 20 years in plastics and private practice, here I am. So in 2019, you decided to no no longer do breast implants. You were going to solely do explants. Talk about that decision and that process and, and how you got there. Well, when I started out in plastics, I did everything. I did, you know, just as much as I could to be busy. I did trauma, reconstructive, oral, um, oral maxillofacial, upper extremity surgery, everything. And I did a lot of breast augmentation for a, a long time. I was doing probably 250, 300 breast dogs a year. Um, but then I had patients that were interested in explanting, started to kind of, in a little skeptical level, doing it. Uh, but then I really saw how they responded. And um, there was a, a very good response, both from an aesthetic standpoint for these patients, but really more importantly, from a health standpoint. Um, at that point, it, it kind of just uh, spiraled in my practice. And, um, you know, I finally decided I would just focus on explanting and, and not implant at all. So when you said you were skeptical at first, was it skeptical as in, I don't know what these women are going to look like after or skeptical as to why women wanted to do this? Not definitely a combination of both. I mean, it's a challenging procedure. Putting in implants is a little bit easier. You have the instant volume, instant gratification. When you remove, it's a little bit more challenging. And then I was like, like most people, well, why would you want to do that? Implants are safe. They have no problems. And lo and behold, I, I discovered over time that, that there are patients that have issues with implants. So it, I'm assuming patients would come back to you and be like, I feel great now. Yeah, exactly. And most of my patients, so in my practice, um, probably 85% plus of my patients feel better after explanting. So it's a big number, um, which kind of astounded me. Um, And and I've been doing this a long time now, and I'm still a little little bit shocked, but, um, you know, I'm trying to understand a little bit more of, of, you know, why this is happening. I mean, it is still a fairly new process. I mean, if we're talking in the grand scheme of things, you exclusively have been explanting since 2019. I mean, that's only five years of doing only this. So like you said, I'm sure you're still learning more and more surgery after surgery and week after week. 
yeah, it's a, it's a learning process. You know, surgery is always a learning process. Um, that's what's kind of cool about it. Um, but with the more patients that I see and the more surgery that I do, I feel like I'm, you know, developing better techniques and giving better patient care for my patients. How many explants do you do a week? Um, usually 12 to 15 a week. Whoa. So that's 30 different implants a week. Yes. That's yes. A lot. Yeah. It's almost exclusively what I do. I still, you know, if a patient wants to add on a tummy tuck or liposuction or some other things, I'll do that. But typically it's mostly just explants at this point. So there are add-ons I can do on at during surgery. Okay. Good. To know. We can talk about it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> good to know. Cause there's this like the little like armpit fat that drives me insane. So while you're in there, maybe if you want to take some of that out, go for it. Yeah. You got it. You got okay. it. Good to know. <laughs> um, I'm assuming this isn't a medical term, but I hear a lot of women talking about this fluffing that happens after explanting. Talk a little bit about that and what that is medically, because I'm assuming that's not what you guys call it. Yeah. Well, you know, we kind of, we like to say things in, in non-medical terms. Right. So we do use that term. Um, but basically after you do surgery, the incisions, um, they heal by, by scar tissue and hardened scar tissue. So um, the fluffing is really softening up of everything over time, which gives some release and hopefully a little bit more volume um, appearance over time. So but when you remove an implant, there's a space in there. There's obviously, at least for me, 10 or so years later, a space has been created and that volume that was in that space is removed. So what are the options for women in this situation when explanting? So I usually, I would say 85% of the time do a breast lift, which is not necessarily a traditional lift in the sense of bringing the nipple higher. Although I do often do that too, but it's really a skin tightening. So it's removing loose skin that's been you know, formed through years of having these implants, sometimes through pregnancy and breastfeeding and just time. Um, so that helps to close off the space. Um, we also use drains, which creates negative tension that closes off the space also. Um, and then a lot of factors come into play, how much breast tissue you have, how large are the implants, how many breast surgeries have you had? So you have to really look at each patient in a very unique perspective and kind of have that discussion beforehand of, of expectations. So speaking of that discussion, you and I had a discussion during my consult. You had said you weren't sure if I actually needed a breast lift. It's something you would figure out once I'm under, you take out the implants. You said you would sit me up and figure it out. Which, right, right. How many patients do you have to do that for? Um, you know, it depends. I'd say maybe about 15% of my patients. If we're on the fence, um, I'll do that because you always want the best shape. That's my priority with the least amount of scars. And sometimes those two are kind of conflicting and, you know, um, you, get, you can kind of choose one or the others, but I would rather choose to have a little bit more scarring with a better shape. Okay. So since we had that consult, I have been thinking about, well, like, what do I really want? And I figured this would be a good time to lay this all out here. And I think it would be cool for people to hear. I haven't had kids yet. It's something, if I do it, it's going to be in the near future. And I would like to attempt to breastfeed. So does that change your opinion on deciding if I should have a lift or not? It does for sure. So a woman who says, I want to breastfeed and it's a super big priority to me, then we would probably bypass a lift because lifting the breasts can cause either decreased milk production when breastfeeding or sometimes women cannot breastfeed. So um, when I do my lifts, I'm trying to be as careful as I can not to come across the milk ducts, but you know, everybody's anatomy is different. So um, if that's a priority, maybe we lean more towards just doing an explant and letting your body heal. That was my uh, consult number two that I just snuck in there with you. Good to know. Okay. So surgery day, walk me and anyone who's, you know, contemplating this or maybe scared. What is surgery day like for someone when they are awake? And then once they're under what's happening? Sure. So I do my surgeries. I have an office suite. So I, I have staff privileges at a hospital, but I prefer to do it in office because it's it's my staff, it's my equipment. So I, I kind of have control. And as a surgeon, that, that, that's, that's what you want. Right. <laughs> um, so all my patients, um, they get a call from their anesthesia provider the night before. So they'll be comfortable with who's giving them anesthesia. And then day of, they come in, I mark them, stand them up in a mirror, discuss where the incisions are going to be, answer questions. Surgery usually takes about two hours, you know, sometimes two and a half, sometimes an hour and a half. We do it with IV sedation. So it's still general anesthesia because you don't remember or feel anything, but we don't tend to intubate or put a breathing tube or give gas. Just less is more in that, those situations. Um, and then recovery is usually about 45 minutes and most of my patients leave 
smiling and comfortable and um you know they'll they'll verbalize when they're ready to leave we're not kicking anybody out the door okay so. good to know <laughs> <laughs> you also offer iv drips there are two different iv drips that you can get i am getting both because i'm like i need all the help i can get to recover so talk about yeah. those iv drips and and what they do for patients yeah. So one is a Myers and one is a banana bag. Basically, um, they're just supplements to help you heal better, less swelling, feel good postoperatively, provide your body with nutrients to help you heal. So my patients that choose to do those, I just feel like they feel better in their recovery postoperatively. Right. And my thought process was, well, I have to fly back eventually to where I live, even though I'm staying yeah. there in Florida for a while, I have to fly back to Seattle and I want to get better as fast as I can because that flight sucks when you feel great, let alone when you've come out of surgery, you know, a week or yeah. so prior. So that was my thought process. Like, give me all the help I can get so I can get back to normal as quickly as possible. Sure. And you already have an IV, so you're already under. Right. So we just put it right through the IV and we're good to go. And then there's also the option to do a nerve blocker. And I've, I even had my call today with your office with Tammy and we were talking about all the different prescriptions that I'd be getting. And she said that, you know, I can have pain medication, but most women don't need it who get the nerve blocker. So talk about that and what it entails and, and why you choose that as an option. Yeah. So the nerve block, it's called Expiral. It's been used a lot of times. We kind of stole it from orthopedic surgeons. They gave it for knee replacements mm. and people had no pain. So we said, ah, we, we want, we want that too. So it's not a block in the sense, it's not like a spinal or an epidural. It's really just an anesthetic, like it's almost like lidocaine you to get at the dentist, oh, yeah. but instead of lasting four hours, it lasts three days. So it's it's just, it's amazing. I definitely recommend it. Uh, most of my patients just take Tylenol postoperatively for pain. Yeah, we still write for of Percocet, course. but most patients just kind of, you know, put it on the bedside and don't take it um, just for emergencies only. That's incredible. Yeah, I actually get lidocaine injections in my back. I didn't realize that it was the same thing. So that is, uh, that's yeah. good to know. Fat grafting is something that is, is offered at months later. It was fascinating to me to find out how many women don't go back to get their breasts bigger after removing implants. Yeah, so fat grafting is an option. I tend to try and wait a year because I think when you when when you do fat grafting, which is basically liposuction, we take that fat, we process it, and we inject it very small amounts at a time into the breast. Um, I, I think waiting a year gives everything time to heal and gives that fat the best opportunity to really like take and, and get blood supply. So um, I'd say probably maybe 5% of my patients choose to do it. I think going in, you know, maybe 50% think they want to do it. But by the time you heal and, and, you know, you've been dealing with issues and health issues for so long, I think many people are just, they're just done with surgery and they just want to move on and, and be happy. Can you tell me about the craziest explant you've had? I'm not trying to be that person. I'm not trying to be your craziest, but I want to know about the craziest one you've dealt with. Um, gosh, I've done so many and seen so many things. I think the craziest things are finding foreign bodies along with the implants in the breast. So I've had um, recently a, a, a large piece of plastic and this patient was having pain on her along her chest wall for years and lo and behold there was a sharp piece of plastic in there where does that like um, from what like a vegetable container like where does the plastic come I, from we're still brainstorming we don't know what it was whether it was part of an iv bag or sometimes they use a, a funnel to put in implants maybe a piece of the funnel so we don't know but when you see something like that yeah. it's a little startling to me too i'm like what the heck is this so those are probably the most interesting um you know we see calcification of the shell around the implant sometimes, which looks like a big egg shell, old bleeding or hematomas. Um, you know, most are fairly straightforward, but there's definitely some interesting ruptures and things like that that we see on a semi-regular basis. I can imagine like what that moment is when you're in there and, you know, every, obviously your staff is like, what is this? I'd love to hear what those reactions are like when you guys open oh, yeah. them up and find yeah. these things. Right. And then we have to explain to the patient, then we have to guess what it is. And, um, you know, some of these patients have had these in for 15, 20 years Jesus. and, you know, we found them. So that's incredible. Um, you, so you mentioned capsule and I've obviously talked about that so far on this podcast. This would be a great time to have a doctor explain what a capsule is and then also talk about a capsulectomy and an end block and the difference and all of that. Yeah. So when you put a foreign body into your system, whether it's a breast implant or any other type of implant, your body sees it as foreign and wants to wall it off. So that's what essentially a capsule is. It's scar tissue formation 
around the implant, which everybody gets. Um, so that's that's the capsule. So when when we explant in my practice, I always remove the capsule. Um, there's some controversy for sure. You know, the American Board of Plastic Surgery, which really looks into the stuff and does studies. Um, they've had some papers out recently that say a partial capsulectomy and removal of the implant can alleviate symptoms also. Um, I'm just kind of better safe than sorry. And right. there's some rare cancers that can form in the capsule too. So I'm like, you know, let's just get it all out. Um, so th those studies are still being done. But I have found that when you do a full capsulectomy, those patients in my practice and in my hands tend to get better. End block is kind of an outdated term oh. that we don't really love. You know, we don't love to use it because it's more of a term that's used in cancer. So if someone oh, has cancer, wow. of the, you want to get everything out in one, in one unit, um, which we always start with surgery with that intention. But if it's very stuck to the chest wall and you're too aggressive and you try and get an end block on everybody, you can end up in some bad places where you don't want to be, okay. which I'm going to knock on wood. I've never, never done that, but you can get into the lung or things like that. Oh, no, so, thank you. I don't want that yeah. add on for surgery. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's that's a no-no for sure. So um, we, we try and use capsulectomy, which means removal of the capsule over an end block. And a lot of patients are still kind of asking, well, I want an end block. And um, it's it's really necessary for cancer. And if you have a rupture, you want to try best you can to get an end block also, because you don't want that silicone particles to kind of get into the, all that wound cavity. To pour out. I did yeah. ask our my audience for some of their questions specifically for you. And I want to shout them out as I ask some of these questions. So Lucy said, should you have implants replaced after a certain amount of years if you don't have issues? So where, where would we stand on that? So I would say if you have saline implants and you like the way they look and you're not having health issues, leave them alone and monitor. Okay. If the saline implants ruptures, you're going to know it. You're going to wake up one morning and one breast is going to be smaller than the other. So that's a saline rupture. Okay. Silicone, on the other hand, is a different story because over time, there is an increased possibility of rupture. When a silicone ruptures, you don't really know it because it kind of sits in your body as a gel and it doesn't, you know, doesn't resorb. Especially so, if you have that capsule, uh, then it's just sitting in that capsule that your body's created. Right. And then over time, if you wait too long, you know, I've had patients 20, 30 years down the road where it breaks through that capsule and then gets into the breast tissue and those are more difficult. So depending on which plastic surgeon you, you, you ask, um, and I always, you know, recommend a board certified by American board of plastic surgery, plastic surgeon. Some people will say every eight years, you should change your silicone. Some people say every 12. So there's no really definitive answer. Okay. Um, the recommendations by the American board of plastic surgery right now are ultrasound or MRI um, every couple of years to determine whether there is a rupture. So that means that if you don't have an MRI or an ultrasound, you could have silicone implants that could be ruptured and you wouldn't even know by looking at your breasts. That's correct. So I do explants on a regular basis where a rupture is found and my patient has no idea. Oh my goodness. Oh, well, it could be me. Who knows? We'll find out soon enough. <laughs> Marina asked, how do you see the, bre by the way, I know you have Marina at your office. It wasn't her. It was something who, <laughs> who listened. <All> right. <laughs> she said, how do you see the breast implant or even explant world changing over the next 10 years? Well, the numbers are going up for sure. For explants. Uh, for explants, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, as women start to kind of put two and two together that maybe some of these health issues that they're having, maybe they're implants. So um, that I see increasing explanting. Also, I think that there's more of knowledge in the medical community. So Ellen asked, is it possible to get nice, round, and perky breasts after explant without a lift? The answer is sometimes. Okay. So um, it depends, you know, how much breast tissue you have going into surgery and how big your implant is. Those are the two essential factors. The most difficult aesthetic patients are patients with very thin breast tissues and very big implants. So um, that, that, that is my most challenging patients. You know, when you have a lot of breast tissue to work with, smaller implant, it makes life a lot easier. So, you know, it just depends on, on your, you know, your uniqueness and your body. Erica asks, is it more common to have a uh, breast implant illness symptoms with certain types of implants? Um, I think personally, and I don't have numbers to prove right. it yet or back it up. I think silicone, um, patients with silicone have a little bit more issues with symptoms, which makes more sense. Just there's more of a 
you know, tissue burn. There's more of a load of silicone in that, in that implant. Saline implants are basically a silicone outer shell filled with saline. So, but I still, I still take out both and patients still do well, uh, but I would take silicone probably more often. So for recovery, everyone keeps asking me, so what's recovery like? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't done it yet, but yeah. <laughs> that's why I, I want to ask you. I'm obviously not going to ask for step by step, but the basics, whether it's from, Hey, the first three weeks, these are things you can't do that people wouldn't know to six months out. These are things you can't do or can do whatever. So overall, yeah. what is recovery like? So basically first three weeks, no gym, no exercise, arms at your side for two weeks. Um, we'll keep you wrapped for like 10 days or so. Okay. Um, but you can, you can go walking. If you get the, you know, the block, you should be relatively pain free. Um, it's just, I don't want a lot of lifting for the first three weeks, six weeks out kind of magic number. If you're over the muscle implants, you're free to do whatever you want. If you're under, you can do all the cardio you want. You can do lower body. I just don't want you engaging. Oh absolute pec muscles like bench press push-ups pilates tennis uh, golf until three months okay. three months clear for anything pretty much okay i didn't realize that it made a difference if your implant was over or under the muscle yeah because when they're under the muscle there's always chances of bleeding that's it's called a hematoma which we want to definitely try and prevent so um, if you're moving the muscle and flexing the muscle all the time your chances of developing hematoma although very small less than one percent it's right. still there so we're just ultra careful are do you find that more implants have been put either way over or under most are under That's most are under. i mean it depends yeah. yeah yeah most are under um you know probably 85 percent are under it depends on the era too you know if, if you have a patient whose implants were placed in the 80s um a lot of them are over um but more modern techniques are are under the muscle for sure yeah mine are i have i'm under i am quote unquote gummy bear and yep. every time I say that I have, I hear women that I've had horror stories, like, oh yeah, I had gummy bear. I'm like, great. This is, this is awesome. Yeah. Good to know. I mean, gum, gummy bear is really a term for silicone implants, like more modern gel silicone implants. So, um, that's just a, a, a term that was coined by a, a doctor in, um, in California, a very good doctor, but, um, <laughs> and that kind of took off once he said it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it sold me, it got me with this world of explanting, and obviously women still getting implants. Overall, like where do you hope this conversation goes? Like what do you as a doctor hope happens as we see more and more explants and obviously women still implanting? Well, I think that one of the great things that have come from this is just informed consent. I think in the past, women were told implants are gonna last a lifetime, you're gonna have no problems, you're not gonna have any health issues. And we know that not to be true. So with any surgery, you need to know the risks, benefits, alternatives, possible complications going in. And that, you know, as an adult, we can make the choices that are best for us based on knowledge. So now if you know, you know, they may cause X, Y, Z symptoms and they may rupture. And, you know, a lot of women may choose not to implant. So, um, you know, certainly I have two young daughters and they know what I do. And, I, you know, I, I hope that they never make that choice personally, but, um, I was going to ask, but I, I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to do that. So yeah, as a dad with daughters, is that ever something yeah. you say to them? Like, Hey, don't do this. Or do you let them kind of see what happens? Um, you know, they're, they're young enough where I haven't had that conversation okay. right now, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, they know what I do on a day, day to day basis. So I think right. they'll be much less inclined to do it. Someone who is debating, should I get an explant or I'm not sure. How do I know if it's my implants causing the problem? What do you want that person to understand? Well, unfortunately, there's no test that you can get that says you have breast implant illness and they should come out. So it's more of a diagnosis of exclusion. I think you need to go to your primary. And if you're having health issues, rule out everything else. Um, and, you know, explanting, it can be a it's a leap of faith in the sense where you don't know if it's going to solve your problems. And I think if you're ready to, to make that choice, you, you go to a, a board certified plastic surgeon that does a lot of these. So experience is key like anything in life. Don't go to the doctor that does two a year you know, because they are complicated cases. Of course. Um, and there are more and more doctors now that are focusing their practices on explants. So I would probably choose somebody with experience. Okay. And this might be a dumb question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on this dumb question. When you say board certified plastic surgeon, shouldn't they all, shouldn't all of you be board certified in order to be plastic surgeon? I don't get how this works. Well, I mean, the gold standard is the American Board of Plastic Surgery. So it's an accredited um, fellowship program that's 
you know, tried and true, um, that uh, rigorous training. So I don't know how it is in, in Washington state, but, um, in Florida, if you're, if you're an MD or a DO and you choose to do something in your office, you could be board certified in emergency medicine. If you want to do tummy tucks or breast dogs, they don't stop you. So that's why I think it's important to find someone with the proper training. Okay. That's a whole different topic. Yeah, but, wait. Um, <laughs> we'll do that post uh, explant when I'm recovering. We'll have you back uh, to discuss that. Well, sure. Dr. Rankin, thank you for being here. I know you're very busy. You, like I said uh, in last week's episode, I said you're popping up all kinds of boobs all week long. So thank you <laughs> for taking the time to be here and, and away from your family for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. And I will see you very soon. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll take great care of you. And it's my pleasure to be here. And thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of my breast explant journey. It's really cool hearing from you. I've heard from so many people who have no implants, don't ever want implants. And they're like, this whole world is fascinating. So I appreciate you reaching out to me. I appreciate you sharing this with people in your lives. It's, it's really cool to hear all of that. So I can't thank you enough, but for real, thank you. On next week's episode, I will be sitting down with my regular podcast co-host and business partner, Anthony. Oh, also my boyfriend. So you're going to get to hear his side of my breast explant journey, I guess. Um, and he's going to also interview me about how I'm feeling. So it's going to be a conversation that will be really cool to hear. So check that out again, go listen to the morning show podcast, watch our live show on Twitch and YouTube. It's called the Carla Marie and Anthony show. I link everything that I talk about below as well as all the information about Dr. Rankin. You should see the videos he posts after he removes breast implants and their capsules from women's bodies. It's a lot of fun to check out. So, so go do that. And, uh, Boobs out? Is that what we're saying? Boobs out. Peace out, boobs. Uh, Ta-ta for now.